As tonight, campaigning begins to heat up for the nation's local elections and what's echoed by the ruling and opposition parties alike is policy focused on safety. The prosecution summons the de facto owner of the second ferries operator for 10 a.m. this Friday, while recovery operations in the disaster site resumes after dangerous conditions forced a three-day hiatus. And the U.S. is now flying manned surveillance missions over Nigeria to try to find more than 200 schoolgirls kidnapped by the militant Islamist group Boko Haram. Early edition begins now. I see trees of green, red roses. 늘 남편 먼저, 늘 자식 먼저. Lady First라는 말을 잊고 살아온 당신. 오늘만큼은 세상 누구보다 당신이 먼저입니다. 한분한분 한분 특별하게 모시겠습니다. Excellence in Flight, Korean Air. It is 5 a.m. in New York, noon in Kiev, and 6 on a Tuesday evening here in Seoul. This is Early Edition at 6, live from Seoul, I'm Moon Gwan Young. And I'm Daniel Chen. Thank you for joining us. We begin with local politics here in Korea. Now, three weeks to go before the June 4th local elections begin, the ruling and opposition parties are set to launch their respective campaigns. The ruling is Henry Party and the main opposition, New Politics Alliance for Democracy, will complete their candidate nominations before registration starts on Thursday, setting the stage for candidates to hit the campaign trail on May 22nd. 17 provincial and city seats will be up for grabs earlier today. The parties named members of their election committees and released campaign pledges largely focused on boosting national safety and crisis management systems. The upcoming elections are considered a public litmus test of the Park Geun-hye administration after it came under fire for a perceived inability to handle last month's Seoul ferry accident. Safety first, it's a phrase that Koreans have taken to heart in recent weeks following the deadly Seoul ferry accident, so much so that safety reform is emerging as a number one campaign issue leading up to local elections on June 4th. And according to our Jim Young Gil, with each party's list of candidates running in the upcoming elections finalized, the results come June 4th would very well depend on which party has stronger public trust. The government's poor initial response to the Seoul ferry accident last month has outraged the Korean public. The insufficient safety measures and lack of capacity to handle such accidents are likely to dominate the campaign period over the next few weeks, heading into election day on June 4th. Both the ruling's Henry Party and the main opposition New Politics Alliance for Democracy have called on the National Assembly to conduct a special investigation to come up with ways to help lawmakers write better bills aimed at preventing future accidents. The ruling party's candidate for Seoul Mayor Chung Mong Jun promised he would prioritize safety issues if elected and carry out massive reforms on the capital's safety management system. Current Seoul Mayor Park Won-sun has also decided to put the issue at the center of his election campaign to reflect mounting public demands for a safer Seoul. It's something we're likely to see in the other metropolitan and provincial races leading up to June 4th. With public distrust of government growing in recent weeks in light of the Seoul ferry disaster, the results on election day could very well depend on which party the people trust more to institute change. Kim young Arirang News. Let's shift our focus now to the nation's handling of last month's tragic ferry accident. In waters off Korea's southwestern coast where the Seoul sank nearly four weeks ago, search divers got back in the water this Tuesday, three days after suspending operations due to poor weather conditions. They have recovered one body from the vessel so far today, pushing the confirmed death toll to 276. 28 people remain unaccounted for. Now that they're back inside the ferry, the divers are trying to gain access to areas that have been blocked off due to obstructions. 
and raising the sense of urgency. Authorities say the walls inside the sunken vessel are weakening and are risk of collapsing. As such, they are trying to secure new routes into the hull. Favorable weather conditions are forecast at the accident site this week. However, underwater currents are expected to strengthen. And on the investigation front, the probe into the shadowy family network that owned the ill-fated Soho ferry has been progressing quite slowly in recent days as some key people have been refusing to show up for questioning. Now, this stonewalling has prompted the prosecution to get tough. Our Kwon Soa has the latest. The weeks-long investigation into the Sewolho ferry disaster is struggling to shift into top gear as key figures are refusing to show up for questioning. In order to turn the screws on the no-shows, prosecutors are raising the legal stakes. Yu byung on the former Sewolho Group chairman and practical owner of the Sewolho ferry's operator, Chung Ejin Marine Company, has been summoned to appear before prosecutors on Friday by 10 a.m. This comes after Yu's two sons and first daughter failed to appear for questioning. Prosecutors have been granted an arrest warrant for the first son, Yu Daegyun. They have been camped out at his house in southern Seoul since Tuesday morning. With no sign of him, authorities are considering forcing the doors to his home open, but it's believed he may be hiding out at a different location. The Yu family and its close associates are suspected of being involved in embezzlement and tax evasion, which could have had a direct influence on the ferry sinking. The latest investigations have revealed that Yu byung was involved in the management of the ship just two months before the accident. That's why the Joint Investigation Headquarters believes Yu could be the top person in charge and the person most responsible for the disaster. Meanwhile, financial authorities are delving deeper in possible monetary irregularities. The Financial Supervisory Service says it began a new probe a couple of days ago on the National Federation of Fisheries Cooperatives and Xinan Capital, which have granted loans to Yu Byung-on's associates in the past. This comes as financial authorities vowed to leave no stone unturned with relation to Yu's finances. Kwon Soa, Arirang News. A question that's been asked frequently and firmly over the last month with regard to the Sewol Ferry tragedy. What if? What if emergency responders had been more aggressive in getting on board the sinking vessel to save more people? In a report that's likely to enrage an already frustrated public, it's been discovered that the first rescue teams to arrive at the accident site did not follow protocol. Our Son jung -in has more. The investigation into the early response to the Sewaro ferry accident has uncovered new developments that are sure to add to the public anger. As the ferry was capsizing at around 9.30 a.m. on April 16th, the chief command team of the Maritime Police assigned patrol ship number 123 of the Mokpo Coast Guard as the on-scene commander, as was the first to arrive at the site. An on-scene commander, according to Korea's Maritime Rescue Manual, takes the lead at an accident site and provides reports on the situation on a regular basis. However, Ship 123 did not follow the orders given by the chief of the Mopo Coast Guard, Kim Moon-hong, who more than four times ordered the evacuation of all the ferry's passengers. No such order was relayed by Ship 123. The manual also requires at least one person to be immediately dispatched to the hull of a vessel in an emergency situation. That directive was also ignored. In another development, it's been learned that the Coast Guard did not send the rescue team to the accident site by helicopter. Instead, they traveled by land and arrived on the scene after the ferry had already sunk. As for the captain of the ill-fated ferry, Lee jun -sok, prosecutors are in the process of bringing manslaughter charges against him. Other key crew members who were responsible for the safety of the passengers in case of an emergency situation but escaped will likely face similar charges. Son Jung-in, Arirang News. President Park Geun-hye is soon expected to apologize to the nation for the government's failure to prevent the recent ferry disaster. Continued discussing related matters with her cabinet on Tuesday, referring to similar discussions she had with senior secretaries over the weekend. President Bot asked cabinet members for their ideas on laying the groundwork for a national emergency response system. After apologizing directly to the people, the president will give details of a new master plan to bolster national safety 
and a new ministry to oversee emergency response and management. She is also expected to talk about reforms in public service to root out irregularities that are blamed for having caused the ferry disaster. Digging deeper, getting to the bottom of stories that impact your life, talking with you on air and online, connecting you with experts on the world's most pressing issues. News and current affairs at its best with Moon Gon Yong and Daniel Che on Early Edition at 6. Samsung Electronics Chairman Lee Gun Hee is recovering from his heart attack and is currently receiving hypothermia treatment in hospital. The Samsung Medical Center in southern Seoul says Mr. Lee was scheduled to end the treatment earlier this morning, but the doctors decided to continue with it to minimize any possible damage to the 72-year-old's heart and brain. Hypothermia treatment keeps the body at a temperature of between 32 to 34 degrees Celsius to prevent toxic materials from generating in the blood. Even after that treatment ends, doctors say they will keep Lee sedated for the time being. He is reportedly in stable condition and breathing on his own. And following that heart attack that hospitalized Chairman Egon he uh, he is a man who played a huge role in making Samsung Electronics one of the biggest companies in the world. The 72-year-old chairman remains in hospital, but his sudden health scare hasn't spooked investors at all. In fact, as our Kim Jian reports, the company's share price has shot up over the last two days. One day after Samsung Electronics Chairman Yi Gon Yi was hospitalized, shares of the tech giant gained the most they had in nine months. Shares of the company jumped 4% on Monday, closing the day at around 1,400 U.S. dollars. As of Tuesday, shares of Samsung Electronics had risen 1.4% in midday trading. Analysts say Samsung's succession plan played a big part in the gain, as the company has a contingency plan for such events. Yi Sun Cheung is likely to inherit Samsung Electronics, the flagship of the group. He and his two sisters will be splitting off some of the group's other affiliates. There are a lot of expectations about a speedy restructuring and succession due to the deteriorating health conditions of Chairman Yi Gon Hee. During the restructuring process, the most likely scenario is that Samsung Electronics will buy more of its own shares, leading to an increase in share prices. Samsung Securities Company, Korea's largest brokerage by market value, will sell its entire stake to Samsung Life Insurance Company. Another affiliate information and communication technology provider, Samsung SDS Company, plans to sell shares in Korea this year. This is not the first time Chairman Lee's failing health had been in the minds of global investors. He was hospitalized back in 2008, then again in 2009, but both times shares of Samsung Electronics gained. Kim ji Naerang News. Well, however, young Koreans have been suffering sharp deteriorations in their credit ratings since the global financial crisis. Uh, we reported on this earlier last week, and uh, there are recent data that backs this trend. That data is this. According to the Bank of Korea, the credit rating is for teenagers and those in their 20s actually worsened after the 2008 financial crisis, as right, you mentioned. Right, not a sign of a healthy economy. Let's try getting a clearer picture on this issue. For that, Dr. Oh jung former professor of economics at Korea University, joins us live in the studio. Uh, Dr. Oh, welcome to the program. Uh, thank you for inviting me. So it surely is not a fun time to be in your 20s here in Korea that, at the time being. Uh, how serious is it and why is this trend, the uh, young Koreans being in debt, why is that trend more prominent in this age group? Uh, normally in Korea, uh, all, almost all the students uh, get loans to pay tuition. Uh, and then also the, they must repay their uh, loans after graduation. But very unfortunately, uh, in Korea we have uh, almost about uh, almost 500,000 college graduates. Among them, only about 200,000 college graduates can get jobs. So the remaining more than half college, college graduates are very hard to get jobs. Therefore, they cannot uh, repay their tuition loan. That's why, the, as you mentioned, the credit rating has worsened 
uh, among all the generations, uh, credit, uh, average credit uh, rating for 20s uh, are worst in Korea uh, because, mainly because, as I mentioned, uh, they cannot pay uh, tuitions uh, after even graduation. Right. I think it's rare that in Korea students actually juggle uh, part-time jobs and study. It's changing, however, but uh, still we have a lot of catching up to do in that respect. Uh, the government actually did try to help out. They came up with many different measures to try and fill that void and address this problem, but apparently it's not very effective actually, so far. Actually, come on also, as you mentioned, the address uh, also the, they are announcing so many measures uh, to solve these issues. but. Most government measures uh, uh, induce a young generation to catch up in a uh, small and medium scale industry. But, but very unfortunately, most the Korean uh, young generations are do not like to catch up at the small and medium scale industry. They want to have jobs, so-called decent jobs, uh, at the government sector, also the uh, big conglomerate, also the even uh, high value added uh, knowledge based the service industry. Right, Korea, we yeah, have this right. saying that we love to be the tail of a giant yeah. a phoenix rather than yeah. the head of a peacock. Yeah, I think so. Uh, are, but unfortunately, such industry have not much sufficiently developed to provide the enough jobs for almost all the college graduates. Because in Korea, uh, more than 80% of high school graduates go to university. So that's why every year uh, we have uh, more than uh, 500,000 college college graduates. So I think um, there must be very severe job mismatch uh, between government policy and uh, what young generation want to have a job. That's big issues, big problem. Also the why government policy cannot solve this issue. Right, so I suppose it all boils down to it's not just a uh, credit ratings issue amongst the uh, the 20s, uh, 20 somethings here in Korea, yeah. but it all boils down to this uh, the societal problem of the nation's extra high college entrance rate right. and then high tuition, and then that, that makes them take out student loans, and then which leads to high youth unemployment, um, which you know which makes it harder for them to pay off their loans. So uh, what can be done? to break this vicious cycle? Well, I think, the, uh, in fact, uh, we must increase our economic growth rate to provide uh, sufficient jobs to young generation, in particular uh, college graduates of more than uh, 500,000 every year. Uh, we need, uh, act, in fact, about maybe 7 or 8 percent economic growth rate. But now we have only 3 or 4 percent. That's why uh, we, we can provided them only uh, 200 or 300,000 jobs. Mm -hmm. The remaining ones uh, just unemployed or they must they have a job, only part-time jobs. Therefore, I believe uh, more than one, one million uh, young generations are waiting or unemployed now. That's why they cannot repay their tuition which they uh, borrowed uh, during the, their studies. That's very severe issues in Korea. I think uh, government uh, provided them more than nine bi my, more than nine trillion loans to them, but among them, uh, more than three percent uh, have been non-performed. That means the default uh, is very high. More than uh, four times of average uh, non-performing loans of household loans. Therefore, how can provide a job, in particular, which they want to? So, I think the best solution is uh, to encourage uh, our high value added the knowledge based service industry. Almost all the Korean uh, college want to have jobs in service industry, education, uh, finance, uh, uh, or broadcasting, etc. So, uh, government must uh, encourage such a job, jobs. That's the best solution. Rather than inducing young generation to work at the small and medium industry, which they do not like to work. Mm. That's a big issue. Also, I guess the mindset of our next generation must change that no job is too small and no job is too big. Well, uh, Dr. Oh Jung-gun, thank you so much for joining us today. We look forward to having yeah. you back here Welcome. soon.
Korea and Japan will hold the second round of talks this week on the still unresolved issue of Japan's sexual enslavement of Korean women during World War II. But many are skeptical that any concrete progress will be made. Our Hwang Sung Hee reports. Senior diplomats from Korea and Japan will continue talks this week on Japan's wartime sexual enslavement of Korean women. Seoul's foreign ministry said Tuesday that Lee sang duk director general of the Northeast Asian Affairs Bureau, will meet with his Japanese counterpart Junichi Ihara on Thursday in Tokyo. The South Korean ministry said it has been holding consultations with comfort women since their first meeting with Japan last month. Government officials, including those from the foreign ministry, are currently collecting the opinions of the comfort women and others related to the victims. This will be the basis of our stance in the upcoming talks with Japan. More than 200,000 women, mostly Korean, were forced to serve the Japanese military at comfort stations in the early 20th century. Tokyo claims the issue was settled through a 1965 treaty when the two countries normalized diplomatic ties. The comfort women are demanding an official apology and legal compensation from Japan. The two sides may also discuss other matters, including Korea's import restrictions on Japanese fishery products that were imposed amid radiation concerns in the aftermath of the Fukushima nuclear plant disaster. Japan's push to regain the right to collective self-defense may also come up during this week's talks. Not much progress was made at the first meeting, but remarks made by U.S. President Barack Obama during his visit to Seoul last month are fueling hopes for some concrete results at the upcoming talks. This was a terrible, uh, egregious violation of human rights, even in the midst of war. Uh, was shocking. But Tokyo's sincerity in settling the comfort women issue still remains in question, as Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe has recently refused to follow in the footsteps of Germany in addressing its wartime atrocities. Hwang Sang-hee, Arirang News. For the first time since they were abducted in the middle of the night from their boarding school a month ago, more than 100 of Nigeria's kidnapped schoolgirls have been seen by the world. In a video released by the militants who are holding them, the girls appear scared and say they've converted to Islam. Kim Yambin has more on the terror group's leaders offer, one the government is likely to refuse. The Nigerian terror group Boko Haram released a 27-minute video on YouTube Monday, in which they say they'll release some of the teenage girls they kidnapped last month in exchange for jailed fighters. Wallah. Around 130 of the abducted girls were shown in the video wearing full veils, citing the first verse of the Quran. The Nigerian government says it is reviewing all options, but the nation's interior minister appeared to dismiss the offer, saying no exchange would take place. Nigeria has deployed two army divisions for the search and rescue operations, while several countries, including the United States, France and Israel, have sent experts to the region. U.S. State Department spokeswoman Jen Psaki on Monday said that Washington has deployed manned surveillance aircraft to Nigeria and is sharing commercial satellite imagery with the Nigerian government to help in the search. Boko Haram militants abducted more than 300 schoolgirls in mid-April from a boarding school in the north of Nigeria. Some have since escaped, but well over 200 are still being held. The militant group has been engaged in violent campaigns against the Nigerian government since 2009. Kim Hyun-bin, Arirang News. You know, today felt like summer, and so uh, for more on the weather conditions, let's go over to Michelle Park. Uh, good evening to you, Michelle. Good evening, guys. And as you said, Kanyang, we had a rather hot day across the nation because of the warm air coming from the southwest. Well, warmth is good. Hopefully not more humidity coming anytime soon. How can we, ex can we expect the same tomorrow, Michelle? 
Well, tomorrow we can expect a cloudy day and daytime highs won't be as high as today, but it will stay warm with temperatures in the low to mid 20s. Now, as you can see, the nation is experiencing an unseasonably warm weather and with the warm temperature comes the high UV, uh, UV levels. So make sure to apply sunblock to protect yourselves. Now going over to our temperature readings, our tops out at 14 before reaching up to 26 in the afternoon. Meanwhile, the southern cities such as Daegu and and Busan will peak up to 26 and 22 degrees. Now moving over to other regions, Jeju Island tops out at 20, Tokto at 22, while Mangkungang tops out at 16. Now as for the weather conditions in Chindo, the weather will stay favorable for the rest of the week. However, the tides are strong today at a speed of 2.3 meters per second, and they are set to gain speed even more in the upcoming days. Now that's all I have at this moment. I'm Michelle Park, and back to you guys. Thank you for that, Michelle. And that brings us to the end of our newscast. Thank you for watching. For our viewers in Korea, have a wonderful rest of the evening. This has been Daniel Che. And I'm Moon Gan Young, too. Those of you in other parts of the world, have a great start to your day, and we hope to see you right back here, same time, tomorrow. Bye bye.